So it was that at dawn, one beautiful autumn morning in late September, I lay well disguised on the wooded summit of a small hill observing a Russian artillery emplacement no more than a kilometre distant, when from a copse about 150 metres away, there came into a clearing directly along my line of sight, a Russian patrol led by a boyish lieutenant. The platoon appeared not to have a care in the world and waddled along like a gaggle of geese in the sunshine. With due presence of mind, careful not to betray my lair, I moved my rifle into position and through the scope watched the undisciplined troop below me. I determined that the officer probably came from highly placed Russian political circles, for contrary to normal practice he wore a tailor-made uniform of the finest cloth and wonderful boots of best leather. Spellbound by the scene, finger on the trigger, I saw the lieutenant suddenly stumble as he caught his foot against the exposed root of a tree. After regaining his balance and composure, he withdrew from a pocket a white handkerchief with embroidered edging and proceeded to wipe his fingers and flick at the dust on his boots. For weeks I had been in the closest association with filth, vile stenches and fleas, locked in a daily ruthless struggle for survival, and I saw the humour of the situation. Alas, there was no place for sentimentality in this war. To spare this platoon of kids might still have led indirectly to immediate danger for myself and my regiment. While the lieutenant carefully shook the handkerchief and folded it meticulously before replacing it in his breast pocket, I aimed the cross wires of the telescopic sight at his heart. With a morbid inner smile, I reflected on the ritual now unfolding, the poetic art of killing known to the Japanese samurai in their Bushido, and with a strange lightness of heart squeezed the trigger for the lieutenant's finale. While the sound was still cracking the morning stillness, the young officer looked with horror at the hole in his chest, from which a small fountain of blood was pulsing. While his platoon ran shouting in panic in all directions, he sank slowly to his knees. His eyes looked for the last time to the sky, and then he toppled sideways into the undergrowth. After I shot dead two of his men imprudently attempting to drag him back into the clearing, the others elected to remain in concealment and eventually withdrew without ever knowing from whence the fatal shots came. I knew, of course, that my lair had outlived its purpose and, like the phantom of the woods, quickly made myself scarce. My scouting activity had given me a good idea of how the enemy was massing his forces. My reports, and those made by other snipers, were an important part of the mosaic of German short-range reconnaissance predicting the focal points of the impending offensive. At eight on the morning of 26 September 1943, hundreds of lightning flashes lit the eastern horizon with a diabolical light. A growling howl neared the German positions and swelled to a deafening roar as the abyss of hell opened. The cargo of hundreds of guns and Stalin organs merged into a single developing explosion. The air sighed with splinters and flying chunks of earth. Gas and dust made it difficult to breathe. As the first wave of explosions died away, a maximum of self-control was required as we heard the shattering screams of the wounded and mutilated. We cowered into our trenches and foxholes as deeply as we could. Some offered prayers or silent petitions for mercy. Others grabbed at hysterical comrades bent on making a run for it in the open. Under the impact of high explosives, the earth trembled. The air developed into a suffocating mix of dirt, gases and metal splinters. Helpless as a child, I assumed the fetal position in my foxhole. A gigantic explosion nearby deafened and confused me momentarily. I looked up to see a great shower of earth and a dark object flying towards me over the trench parapet. Instinctively, as I ducked my head, the object thudded down in the filth. I recoiled in horror. The steaming remains of a comrade from the adjacent trench, a torso without limbs, its chest, neck and face ripped by metal splinters into a bloody, amorphous mass, had come to join me. The mouth of the thing, surprisingly unhurt, began to groan, and a guttural voice spoke as if from another world. What happened? Why is it so dark? Why can't I feel my body any more? Unable to understand, the stumps of the upper arms shrugged helplessly. Help me, the remains implored with a gurgle. Panic seized me. 
Almost in hysteria, I kept to the trench wall so as not to have to touch the mutilated torso. The moribund object began to cry, but in answer to my prayers, he soon died. Deaf to the hellish backdrop of tank guns and mortars, I attempted to compose myself, for the infantry attack was imminent. As abruptly as it had begun a half hour before, the barrage stopped, to be replaced by the rattle of tank tracks and the hurrah of the approaching Russian infantry. In a split second we emerged from our shock. While medics attended the seriously wounded, those of us still in a condition to fight raised our rifles to the trench parapets and returned the Russian fire. With deadly accuracy, round after round from my carbine found a billet in the ranks of the attackers. The barrel grew so hot that the anti-rust grease melted and dripped over my fingers. Shells continued to pound our lines, and the air was thick with metal splinters. I was mobile, moving from trench to trench, always seeking cover, snatching ammunition from dead Russians who had almost made it. Along a small sector of the front there seemed little sense to it all. Our objective was mere survival. The individual soldier knew nothing of the greater scheme in which this Russian offensive was linked to their attempt to break through our lines at the Lower Dnieper. For eight long days the battle raged, constantly switching between attack, defence and counterattack. German companies and regiments melted away, lacking reserves. The dressing stations worked day and night. An unending chain of buckets full of human tissue and amputated limbs made the trip to waste trenches behind the operating tents. Hundreds of men waited for their turn under the knife, groaning, crying, dying. The medics were quite ruthless in segregating out the hopeless cases. Some met death in a state of morphine intoxication, but the majority died alone and in agony. Many of the most hopeless cases were put out of their misery where they lay if the danger existed that they might fall into Soviet hands, for the enemy practised diabolical tortures of the wounded as a matter of routine. It was in this environment, as a youth of nineteen years, that I lost what remained of my innocence. I determined to sell my life as dearly as possible, and in doing so developed an extraordinary professionalism. I kept my nerve where others succumbed to panic. I used my sniper's rifle as a surgical weapon with deadly precision. I had the feel for battle knew the rhythm of defence, cover, attack. My lack of fear for injury and death amounted to a state of mind that one calls bravery. It is one of the strange things about war that a few soldiers appear invulnerable to serious injury or death. I was one of these, and there can be no doubt that Hitler also had this same gift of avoiding serious injury at the front, living a charmed life in the trenches of the Western Front from 1914 to 1918. On 4th October 1943, the fighting abated, allowing our exhausted and much reduced force a few days to regroup. Five days later, the Red Army resumed its attack on what remained of 3rd GD, which it outnumbered by 20 to 1. The obligatory artillery barrage began at 10 in the morning. 400 batteries and 220 Stalin organs pounded our lines with 15,000 exploding projectiles per hour. The division went to ground, and when it stopped, men came forth like zombies out of the steaming sulphuric air and churned earth surrounding their positions. In despair they readied themselves, each Jaeger a true soldier hewn from the granite rock of self-control, battle experience, dourness and determination to come through. Like a flued wave the Russian soldiers of foot came towards them. Their reserve of expendable men seemed inexhaustible while the Wehrmacht units, composed of all there was and no reserves, shrank ever smaller, the Red Army grew ever larger. In this it was helped, in no small measure, by the Japanese decision not to pressurise the Siberian frontier and so allow its defenders to be transferred to the Russian Western Front. Moreover, every male aged between 14 and 60 was conscripted without exemption. Many of the units were intended as simple cannon fodder, being stuffed into an army greatcoat over their civilian clothes and given two days' weapons training. So hasty was this process that there were insufficient arms to go round, and there came into being the tactics whereby the leading attack wave would be armed with rifles or machine pistols, while the rear waves left the trenches unarmed, 
being required to pick up the weapon of a fallen front-wave soldier on the traverse towards the German lines. The danger in this proceeding must have been obvious even to the simple-minded, and the Russian Army Command solved it by having NKVD Secret Service troops, the secret police on hand, to forcibly clear the trenches at the word of command. During this attack I witnessed at first hand how the Russian waverers and doubters were simply shot down from behind while the others headed for the German lines, as if confronting nothing more worrisome than a heavy shower of hail. For us it was a rabbit shoot, the terrain before us a killing field of indescribable size with walls of Russian dead and seriously wounded. The corpses piled up, often towering higher than the height of a man. The rear wave attackers had to climb up the dead, who were incidentally useful as bullet traps since they provided cover and prevented us continuing to fire into the rear ranks. Sometimes the dead were stacked so high that the attack would begin to peter out and tanks had to be brought up to plough a way through, no consideration being given to the screams of the wounded during this activity. The tracks of the T-34s squashed down the cadavers, cracking bones like dry twigs. It was like watching bulldozers flattening a rubbish tip composed of a humanity, some of which was still living, and screamed and cursed in its death agony. The battle escalated, when some of the attackers finally got through after we ran short of ammunition. They were repulsed with bayonet and sharpened entrenching tool. Our defence was berserk enough to ensure that by evening the Russian attack, lacking numbers, disintegrated. I was under the immediate instructions of my company commander, and found myself repeatedly at the centre of the fighting. The distance between ourselves and the enemy often shortened so swiftly that I put aside my sniper's rifle after a few rounds in favour of the MP-40. I always carried the machine pistol slung across my back for those difficult situations in which the front lines dissolved into a general melee. Under 30 metres the telescopic sight was only of limited use because the visual field it offered was too narrow. Aiming over open sights below the telescopic mounting was also impractical because the sight masked most of the field. These situations were very awkward for the sniper. He had to keep a close hold on two weapons and because of it ran a special danger of being identified as a sniper and accordingly a priority target. Fighting would die down towards evening, but the tension rarely fell away, for the Russians made no secret of their moves to reorganise, and we knew that a resumption of activity was only a few hours away. Here the sniper was particularly valuable, for with the occasional well-aimed long-range shot, he could force the enemy to maintain his distance. During the night of 10th October 1943, the Russians broke off their fire on our sector, and in a few minutes a suspicious lull occurred. The company commander used the situation to make a swift inspection of the trenches and gather reports. Jaeger in a forward trench reported unusual movements in the bushy terrain before them, and an eight-man veteran patrol was assembled. I accompanied them as escort, creeping through the wasteland with great caution about thirty metres away on their flank. I carried my sniper's rifle. The patrol carried MPs and hand grenades. Their movement forward was through knee-high grass towards a spot which had been indicated as suspect. After about 300 metres we heard the sound of muffled voices. At a signal from the platoon leader, I found myself a well-hidden lair amongst a clump of bushes, raised my rifle and surveyed the area through the sight. About 80 metres ahead I could vaguely make out a depression like a small valley. The patrol worked forward on the edges of this depression, and when the patrol leader investigated below, he espied a battle group of about a hundred Russian soldiers, old men and boys, probably under the leadership of an inexperienced political commissar. Anxious and uncertain, they were huddled together, chattering and smoking. The platoon sergeant crept back and used hand signs to explain his discovery. One slipped over to my position, informing me that despite being heavily outnumbered, at first light the platoon would make an attack. It was hoped that this would drive the surprised Russians instinctively towards the exit from the depression where I would be waiting to pick them off. To the east the sky lightened slightly two hours later. Many of the Russians had fallen asleep, those on watch visibly not vigilant. 
At a signal from the platoon leader, each Jaeger took up three stick grenades and primed them. As if from nowhere, the twenty-four grenades exploded virtually simultaneously among the Red soldiers, who at once broke out in panic. Those who had not been seriously wounded ran blindly in all directions, firing into the darkness, which resulted in further casualties to their own side. The screams of the wounded rent the air. Calmly, the Jaeger aimed and fired their machine pistols into the leaderless rabble. As expected, the Russians slowed towards the exit to the depression and straight into the crosswires of my carbine. It was a routine massacre. Aim at the chest, quickly but smoothly pull the trigger, repeat, aim, fire. Round after round found its goal with deadly certainty. Five were already dead, sprawled across the grass. When the others hesitated, it gave me time to reload another clip. Before they could recover, the next five joined their comrades. The remainder turned back to be met by the MP fire and grenades of the patrol. It moved back and forth like this between the depression exit and the sink for several minutes before the butchery reached its conclusion. We had sustained no casualties or wounded. We left behind us a heap of mutilated bodies and the cries of the wounded and dying. Patrol and sniper vanished without a sound, like spirits of the mist in the grey light of early morning. This brave surprise raid, not without its share of luck, afforded our decimated company a few extra hours of deceptive peace. But at midday the Russian counterblow hit us with undiminished force. With courage born of despair, we held out until evening. The Russians called it off at dusk and shortly before midnight we learnt that the Russians had finally broken through along another sector of the front and were assembling their forces to concentrate on widening and deepening the breach there. For our company it meant salvation. We had become so weak that we would not have been able to withstand a single extra day of it. Hunger, exhaustion, wounds and infections had all taken their toll, and we needed rest desperately. For days we had feasted on nothing but salted gherkins and apples discovered in Russian farm outhouses, and the toughest intestines were no match for this lethal mixture. Everybody had diarrhoea. We were given a week to take a breather, sleep, clean ourselves and our apparel. Hygiene is an aspect of military good order that cannot be underestimated. During basic training and while in barracks, the Wehrmacht had regular and unannounced hygiene inspections, which included the genital region. These were carried out by a staff surgeon and several medic NCOs. In the dining hall we paraded and stripped naked. The doctors were especially keen on detecting the earliest indications of sexual diseases, inflammations and conditions caused by uncleanliness. To have unclean genitals was a disciplinary offence, and if an impending inspection was suspected, no effort was spared to bring the region involved up to scratch. In action, Every opportunity had to be taken to maintain bodily hygiene, the alternative being a number of unpleasant medical conditions and tiny unwelcome visitors. On 21st October 1943, the Russians launched a fresh assault. Despite a number of successful holding actions and counter-attacks, they gained territory. Throwing the main German battle line into chaotic disorder, contact was lost between units and a highly unstable situation developed. For me, the picturer was totally confused. In my dugout, in a mixture of fascination and fear, I watched two red soldiers enter a neighbouring trench, whose occupants had run out of ammunition. The first Russian fell when an entrenching tool split his head open, but the other proved himself a fantastic bayonet fighter. With cat-like agility, he parried every effort of the six Jaeger to put him down. In the wild melee I was never able to obtain a clear enough view of the Russian soldier to shoot him, and I witnessed how one after another he disposed of his opponents. He was a veteran whose single-minded determination brought him success, and their combined efforts were insufficient to overwhelm him. They seemed to lack conviction and offered individual, and not coordinated, resistance to the intruder. It seemed almost as if they went to their doom spellbound. The last survivor put up the best struggle, and this gave me the opportunity to shoot. As the Russian lunged with the final deadly thrust, his face passed momentarily into the crosswires and I fired. 
The German infantryman stared almost uncomprehendingly at the burst head of the Russian, destroyed by an explosive round. Bone fragments and strips of cerebellum had sprayed the German's face and uniform. A combination of fear and relief at his unexpected salvation seized the man. Inspired by a new will to live, he sprinted for my dugout and made it. This incident exemplifies what is required of the good sniper. More than practical shooting ability, he needs a high degree of self-discipline enabling him to respond correctly to apparently hopeless situations. In action, the military sniper is more valuable for precise and sure weapons handling in routine infantry combat than laying in wait for a single kill. For this reason, by tradition, snipers had always been recruited from among veterans in the field, rather than from green marksmen steeped in theory. The career of a young sniper fresh from training was 15 to 20 rounds on average before he fell in action. The principal reasons for failure were choice of hide lacking secure escape route beyond view of enemy, aversion to zigzag sprints through enemy mortar fire, firing too many rounds from the same position, if a sniper was spotted, as a rule he came under fire from enemy heavy infantry weapons. Under mortar fire, without the opportunity to withdraw unseen, his only option was to sprint. This was dubbed Hasensprung, the hare's jump, and involved suddenly leaping up to dart in wild, irregular zigzags to the nearest dugout. The run through enemy fire required great presence of mind and nerves of steel. Inexperienced snipers who remained quaking in their boots were soon killed off. Despite the great efforts of 3rd GD, the Red Army made such inroads to the south of the division that an encirclement threatened. 6th Army was split in two, enforcing an immediate retreat to the far banks of the Dnieper to establish a new defensive line and ward off disaster. As usual, Oberkommando des Heeres, or OKH, German Army High Command deliberated far too long and when the order to fall back on the Dnieper finally came on 31st October 1943, the Russians had already driven a broad wedge through the German front and were poised for the decisive thrust. At Nikopol, a bridgehead was to be set up to keep open the manganese mines and ensure the production and supply of the ore for as long as possible. The bridgehead was composed of nine divisions, including 3rd GD, all reduced to about a quarter of their authorised size in men and materials. We were allowed three weeks to dig in and organise our defences. Supplies were resumed, but only in modest quantities, and included a supplementary item of uniform in the shape of cotton-padded reversible camouflage suits, one side white for snow conditions, the other having a camouflage pattern. Our initial joy at this issue of warm winter apparel quickly evaporated. The thin outer material tore easily. It was not impermeable, and during rainfall the padding became saturated, making the suit uncomfortably heavy and destroying its protective effect against low temperatures. In really low temperatures, the cotton froze. The new fur-lined boots had similar drawbacks and additionally provided parasites with an idyllic environment. The suits were useful only when the wearer was required to remain immobile in dry cold. The voluminous cut enabled it to be worn over the field grey uniform, but here one sweated profusely at the least exertion, and since the material was impermeable, it gave rise to colds and associated disorders. Once the warmer weather set in, hundreds of discarded suites finished their useful life strewn along the route of the division's retreat. Thus, the theme of cotton type camouflage suites was resolved for the duration by 3rd GD. We were much better served by warm underwear, blankets and tents. In the spring of 1944, I persuaded the regimental tailor to make me a camouflage smock from a tent, and this served me well for a long period. I also had a light white camouflage suit made for the snow. This was easy to roll up and carry. The thin cotton was so light that it did not interfere with my movements even when wet, and it dried as quickly as the smock. The enemy's activity at this juncture was limited to surprise raids and sniper fire. I went out hunting daily, the occasional deadly round disquieting the Russian lines. For this purpose, I used the burnt-out ruin of a T-34 in no man's land as a safe hide. At daybreak I slid below the vehicle body, which afforded me excellent protection. I could observe and fire on the Russian trenches through a hole in the tracks. Contrary to practice, 
I used this position for four days and fired five rounds. The Russians had no heavy weapons, and I felt absolutely safe beneath the wreck of the Steel Colossus. The enemy became extremely cautious, and since it was becoming more difficult for me to find a target, on the fifth day I took an observer with me. The choice fell on Balduin Moser, a Tyrolean, whom I had befriended several weeks before. As we set out before dawn that morning for my armoured hideout, we had no foreboding of what lay in store for us. My error had been to fire from that secure position too often, and the Russians had identified it as my location on the grounds that there was nothing else remotely likely in the neighbourhood. Up to this point the Soviets had not stationed any artillery in this sector, and had been defenceless against me. However, in response to their discovery they had called on a sniper of their own to nail me. He was now lying in wait for his opportunity. The morning sun glinted as it rose above the eastern horizon and threw its first rays across the barren steppe. Balduin and I had settled in below the T-34 and were now carefully scrutinising the enemy positions for a victim, perhaps one recently arisen from his sack and emptying his fruit tin over the trench parapet without a thought for the possible dangers. Probably it was no more than the merest reflected glint of sunlight from binoculars projected a little too far forward, which alerted the Russian sniper to the fact that our position was occupied. Aiming the cross wires of his telescopic sight at the spot where he had seen the flash of sunlight, in his well camouflaged position he awaited his opportunity. Seconds later he fired. It so happened that we identified each other in the same instant, for Balduin was whispering to me. Two fingers right near the little hump, there's a movement. The bullet struck the binoculars in Balduin's hands and exploded against his mouth, destroying the lower part of his face. He stared at me in panic, gurgling blood. A second round exploded between us on the ground. I dived for the darkest corner and pulled Balduin towards me by the ankles. We were stuck here until nightfall. Any attempt to leave our hiding place would mean certain death at the hands of this sniper. As for my wounded friend, I was completely helpless. This was not a case for a first aid dressing or tourniquet, but the soonest possible professional help from a surgeon. The remains of Balduin's tongue had swollen to the size of a child's ball and was blocking the airway. My attempt to force the tongue to one side caused him to retch and made breathing more difficult. Only a tube or a tracheotomy could save him now. I resigned myself to watching him die. Breathing gradually became more difficult to him, and eventually he drowned in his own blood. At the end he gave me one last sad look, offered me a final handshake, and then died in my arms. I maintained a death watch over Balduin until night fell. When it was quite dark, I pulled the body out from below the tank and carried my friend back to the trenches, made a brief report to the company commander, and handed him Balduin's identity tags. Next morning we dug the grave. In the treeless step there was no wood for a cross, and so after the interment his steel helmet was laid on the mound. The same night the wreck of the T-34 was wired for explosives and blown up next morning, the purpose being to avoid having the Russians shell it and so endanger our trenches. A few days later the next Russian offensive swept forward and obliterated the last resting place of Balduin Moser. On 20 November 1943 the Russians attacked on a modest scale, which presented no problem for the defenders. Nevertheless, they had to be watched closely and casualties weakened our fighting strength. On the night of 25th November, they concentrated especially on the sector defended by 3rd GD, throwing forward 200 tanks and several regiments of infantry. GJR 144 was faced by 50 tanks. We were roused from sleep at five that morning by an artillery barrage of one hour's duration, we had no anti-tank weapons to hold off two armoured brigades and infantry riding on the tank hulls. The tanks rolled across the GJR 144 lines, and once behind us the infantry disembarked, quickly knocking out battalion and company headquarters and rear supply areas. The second wave consisted of flamethrower tanks. The smell of burning and scorched flesh and the infernal screaming of the suffering was a terrible demoralising factor. Our command structure broke down and each unit fought for itself down to the last bayonet and knife. 
For hundreds of Yaga, death came in the cruelest circumstances. No prisoners were taken, and the wounded were treated with the utter barbarity one had come to expect of the Russians. One could accept the artillery barrage as a kind of natural cataclysm to which one was exposed and helpless. But the steady creaking, mechanical approach of the deadly tank force, accompanied by the blast of countless enemy mortars, chilled the heart of the bravest, and the impulse to turn and run was difficult to resist. As the tanks approached, through binoculars, I had carefully scrutinised the infantry riding the hulls in an effort to identify the commander, either by his clothing or weapons. Only when the Russians were within hundred metres did we receive the order to fire. At once, I fired at as many tanks as possible. Veteran Soviet soldiers would recognise the danger at once, jump down and seek cover behind the vehicle. This had the effect of slowing down the attack. Those who remained sitting where they were got a fatal bullet for their trouble. The last act was always to fire into the reserve fuel tank at the rear of the T-34. With any luck, the fuel would spill through the ventilation slots into the engine where it would frequently ignite. This fire would stop the tank in its tracks, so to speak. We were shooting for our very lives, but no matter how enormous their casualties this Russian wave was going to break through, for we had too few anti-tank guns and light mortars. The distance soon reduced to the point where we could see their faces. Confronted by a withering fire from our trenches, the Russian foot soldiers held back a wary hundred metres, while twenty T-34s rolled ever closer with a menacing growl. We prepared the few hollow charges we had. Our other anti-tank weapon was stick grenades in tied bundles. Placed in a tank's wheels, they would often blow the track apart, thus rendering the vehicle unmanoeuvrable. Unfortunately, these defensive measures required the infantryman to be in the closest of contact with the T-34, a procedure that called for a high degree of commitment and bravery. When a tank got to within ten metres of our lines, its field of fire was masked and presented the defenders with the opportunity to approach. They had to be nimble, for if the tank crew spotted the trench, they would manoeuvre across it, twisting and turning the tank so as to collapse it and bury the occupants alive. For this reason, only battle-hardened veterans were trusted with anti-tank devices. As the Russian tanks passed the critical distance, our selected Yaga snaked towards them on their bellies, sprang up and attempted to place the charge against the turret, engines or in the wheels. Only a few made it that far, however, for the Russian infantry spared no effort to thwart them in the endeavour. Five of the Colossi fell victim to explosions sufficient to immobilise them, but the other fifteen rattled and screeched through our lines as we cowered low in our foxholes and trenches. Not every man kept his nerve. Now and again someone would take to his heels in an attempt to flee the danger, only to be mown down by the Russian infantry. I watched as a comrade thirty metres away made a run-in wild zigzag towards a neighbouring trench. Fifteen metres short, his legs were riddled by an MG burst. Propping himself on his elbows, he tried to drag himself the remaining distance while a T-34 headed straight for him. For a moment he paused, gathering his strength for a last, desperate effort. With great presence of mind, he allowed the steel monster to approach and, a few metres short, hurled himself aside. Either by grim mischance or due to the alert reactions of the tank driver, the vehicle changed course abruptly, the tracks crushed and then entangled the man's legs. The mechanical system drew him into the innards and mangled him to death. To our bewilderment, having crossed through our positions, the T-34s kept on going instead of turning to sandwich us between Soviet armour and infantry as expected. The only explanation was a breakdown in communications or an overestimation of our ability to resist. As the tanks disappeared towards the rearward lines, we geared ourselves to tackle the Russian soldiers afoot, who were rushing our lines shorn of protection. Snipers, who were both hated and feared, were tortured to death if captured. Accordingly, at every impending attack, I decided how I would get rid of my sniper's carbine with its telltale telescopic sight should the need arise, and I had prepared a hiding place for it among some ammunition boxes. Shortly before the wave of Russian attackers reached our trenches, I concealed it and took up an MP40 instead. With a rousing, Hurrah! the Reds threw themselves upon our positions, 
and merciless hand-to-hand -hand fighting broke out. Driven by a primeval instinct, we embarked upon an orgy of infighting. Here a rifle butt smashed into a face, an MP burst transformed a stomach into a bloody steaming mass. A shovel edge clove a man's shoulders, bayonets and knives stabbed and ripped. Against a backdrop of death cries, groans, screams, the occasional pistol round, gun smoke, sweat and blood, we abandoned our humanity. Like a sack of potatoes, a mortally wounded Russian fell into the trench. His ribs intercepted a bayonet jab from a comrade, which had been intended for me. The bayonet tangled in his body, and the Soviet tugged to free the weapon a second too long. Pushing the first Russian away from me, I let the second have the full force of my iron-capped mountain boot in his testicles. A crack told me that I had split the pubic bone. Screaming, his face contorted with pain, the Russian fell on his back. I fell on him, pressing my thumbs to his windpipe. In response he gurgled, eyes bulging from their sockets. From the corner of my eye, I saw a dark shadow lunge at me. Ducking instinctively, my steel helmet took the force of a blow struck with the butt of a rifle. Slightly stunned, I rolled to one side and crossed my arms in front of my face to parry the next jab. A burst of MP fire raked his back, spattering me with blood and ribbons of intestine. As I jumped up, I saw a Russian bayonet stab into the kidneys of the Jaeger who had saved me. In terrible agony he froze like a column of salt. The rifle of the dead Russian was at hand, and snatching it swiftly, I rammed the iron-ended stock into the face of the third enemy soldier before he could free his bayonet. Blood seeped from the amorphous mass which had once been his face, and it was an easy job to deliver him the coup de grace. Amid this raging carnage, I lost all sense of time, horror and pity. Shortly before, I had been sprayed in the face with earth when an enemy grenade exploded nearby and felt a light blow to my nose and jawbone. Only now, as the fighting ebbed, did I taste the blood and become aware of the sticky mass on my face and neck. A handful of German infantry stood surveying a medieval-like battlefield of groaning, crying, dying and dead soldiers. Sepp, you've been hit. Let's have a look at it, a comrade said. My right nostril had been split, and a number of tiny metal splinters had lodged in my lower lip, but there was no time to seek medical aid, for with shouts of hurrah, the next wave of Russian infantry was approaching from afar. The few of us still able to fight closed ranks. Gathering up the weapons and ammunition of our fallen, we occupied an earth bunker about 200 metres behind the front line. Prudence dictated that I should leave my sniper's rifle behind in its hiding place. In the ensuing melee we succeeded in holding the bunker, but another group was not so fortunate. Twenty Jaeger had been cut off and were forced to occupy a forward trench, from where they offered stout resistance until their ammunition ran out. The five survivors surrendered to the enemy, and we watched as they were hustled away with kicks and blows from rifle stocks. The fifteen Russian tanks which had combed through our lines and kept going came to a sorry end when ambushed by two SP guns and an 88. This removed the threat to our rear. We received a signal from company that the two SP guns had been sent forward and, on their arrival, would launch an immediate counter-attack to tie down Russian forces in the sector for as long as possible. Both sides were in the process of reorganising. For the time being, I was armed only with a standard K18K rifle without telescopic sight, but even so, using the occasional well-aimed reminder, I forced the Russians to keep their distance. In this kind of situation there is no opportunity to camouflage. The sniper seeks out a protected lay with a good field of fire and continues to shoot from this position amid his comrades until spotted and targeted, or the battle line changes. It took an hour for the SP guns to arrive. An attack plan was quickly decided upon, and we moved out. Eighty Jaeger afforded cover by the SP guns were to attempt the recapture of our forward trenches. For the moment the Russians had made a tactical error and were not able to reinforce their depleted units. Visibly surprised by the counter-attack, they took to their heels and were soon back in their original positions. I discovered my sniper's rifle undamaged among the ammunition boxes where I had left it. 
The impetus of his attack convinced the SP gun's commander to keep on going for the Russian lines. With my carbine, I maintained a rapid, accurate fire aimed at senior enemy personnel, hampering their efforts to assemble some kind of effective defence. Bereft of their tanks and lacking heavy infantry weapons, their line began to crumble piecemeal. As they withdrew further, I attempted to inflict the maximum casualties, and I lost count of the number that fell to my shooting. When the chance arose, I reported to a dressing station to have my wounds looked at. My nose received stitches and a plaster, the metal splinters in my lip were drawn out using a magnet. The wounds hardly merited a few days of convalescence, and so I remained at the front. Our attack was driven home with determination, and the Soviet defence line began to dissolve. I was assigned to a twelve-man platoon to clear a stretch of enemy positions. We encountered no resistance and found only dead and badly wounded enemy soldiers. However, we remained alert, for there were a number of well-built lower workings that might have concealed an ambush force. Cautiously and watching to all sides, we approached one of these workings, from inside which issued some gurgling noises. A Jaeger called out in Russian that anybody inside should come out at once with his hands up, and when nothing happened, he fired a burst from his MP-40 into the gloom. Still nothing stirred, although the gurgling noises continued. Gingerly, he felt his way forward. There was a chink in the ceiling, which served to throw a pale gleam into the room ahead. Scarcely had he put a foot inside than he cried out in horror. We were confronted by a scene of ghastly cruelty. The five Jaeger whom we had seen taken away from their trench as prisoners were gurgling in their own blood. The Russians had cut their throats, not wishing to draw attention to their presence by shooting the men instead. Their arms and legs trembled uncontrollably, their hands clawed helplessly at the dirt floor. They were beyond help, but it was an age before death brought an end to their suffering. It was experiences such as these which made one hard and ruthless towards the Soviets. The question of whether this kind of shot or that was ethical faded into irrelevance when the recipient was this particular enemy. Within me at least they sowed the seed of a hatred for all of them without exception, and I vowed that I would never spare a single one of them if I had the chance to shoot. It was a phenomenon shared by both sides. Everybody legitimised his behaviour in revenge. My comrades were none too fussy in this regard. A Russian sergeant who had been left behind because of a leg injury became the scapegoat for the five murdered German infantrymen. They required of him information about positions and assembly points, attack plans and so forth. It was irrelevant to them that the man obviously had very little knowledge regarding such matters. It was simply an excuse to exact revenge. In any case, his replies to the lieutenant and assistants to the Inquisition were not satisfactory, even though the occasional punch in the face was thought likely to loosen his tongue a fraction. Even if he knew everything and had spilt the beans, it would still not have been enough. Another excuse would have been found. The brutality of the interrogation escalated. Finally, one of the assistants decided that sharpened matchsticks should be driven below the fingernails of the prisoner to make him talk, and the screams of pain this induced seemed to egg on the torturers. It was a veteran warrant officer who put an end to the scene, saying, Enough of this shit, you're as bad as Ivan. He took his 08 from its holster, and shot the Russian in the back of the head. A silence fell, and the Inquisition at last came to its senses. The lieutenant made no protest at the disrespect shown to his rank. The shot seemed to bring him out of a trance. While German losses in men and material were never fully made good, the Russians could call upon seemingly bottomless reserves from the hinterland, and on 19 December 1943 they unfolded a fresh offensive against the Nikopol bridgehead. For the purpose, they had ten full divisions supported by fighters and bombers unopposed in the air. Like incoming surf, the endless waves of tanks and infantry swept towards the German lines, and after twelve days of unceasing assault, 3rd GD was virtually wiped out. On some sectors of the front, one or two German infantrymen were asked to defend hundred metres of front under pressure from a force fifty times their number. 
Even the most battle-hardened veteran was affected by the stress of living in perpetual fear. On the last two days of 1943, elements of GJR 144 began to crack. In the face of this very dangerous development, the regimental adjutant and ordnance officer toured the front line aboard a motorcycle combination in an attempt to rally spirits and urge the men to hold on. I was with 144, which had held off unceasing attacks for days. Constantly changing my position, I loosed off the occasional deadly round to keep the Russians under cover and afford my comrades some respite. By some miracle I continued to survive all bombardments unscathed, aware of our horrifying casualty rate. It was when isolated singly or with only one comrade in a trench complex, the lines of communication and supply having broken down, that panic would suddenly seize the occupants. Anything could be the catalyst, lack of ammunition, the sudden realisation that one was totally alone, the loss of contact to the command post, the wounded left untreated, the sight of other trenches being abandoned. Even though I had the invaluable advantage of being at liberty to wander our sector, now and again I felt the almost irresistible impulse to get away from the front line to the relative safety at company headquarter. Whenever I dropped in on a stretch of trench, the relief of the occupants was only too visible. Their garrulous talk and questions as to how things stood where I had just come from had about them the stench of imminent disaster. I found a dugout staffed by a solitary MG gunner. His nerve had gone. Sep, take me with you, he begged in despair. Shit, they don't come for the wounded anymore, and we get no ammunition or food. At that instant we heard the snarl of an approaching motorcycle and watched as its Hauptmann rider laid the machine on its side and sprinted in a zigzag towards us. His arrival coincided with the decision of five men in a neighbouring trench to give up and head for the rear. Realising at once that if not nipped in the bud it could start an avalanche, he tore free the MP40 slung round his neck and fired a burst over their heads. The group paused and turned to stare at the officer. They seemed thunderstruck. Suddenly one of the group raised his rifle and fired, the bullet narrowly missing the captain who retaliated by aiming his machine pistol at the rebel, lining him up in its sights. Weapons down and back in the trench, you scum, he bawled. The men came to their senses. The officer lowered the MP40 but kept it ready. As he strode up to the five, a Russian mortar bombardment began, forcing everybody low. The officer was in the vacant trench before its former occupants made their scrambled return. Ten minutes later, filthy and exhausted, he arrived at my side as a salvo of light mortars sighed overhead. The three of us, the captain, the MG gunner and I, watched as they fell long, exploding into the ground, where they threw up a great spray of earth. A few seconds later, clumps of turf pattered down around us, the captain exuded a certain confidence which told me that he knew something. Men, don't do anything stupid. Just hold out. All is in hand, he assured us, ducking his head as more mortars swept overhead. The Russians can't keep up this pressure. So far, everyone has held his position in the most exemplary manner. We are in the process of constructing a new defensive line and will soon fall back in good order. The lines of communication will be restored later today. Just hold on. I am relying on you. With that, and always keeping to cover, he scrambled for the next trench, leaving behind the present of a box of chocolate bars, which we devoured greedily. A half hour later, I changed my position. It was amazing to witness the effect of the staff officer's visit. The German infantryman held firm. A potentially disastrous and deadly panic had been averted, and the front remained stable. Of course, not all men could take the stress, and many reported to the field hospital with self-inflicted wounds or feigned illnesses. It was an art in which a number of men specialised, imparting their secret knowledge of techniques only to a selected few. I found out that eating Nivea cream brought about symptoms identical to yellow jaundice. To avoid powder traces and burns at the edges of self-inflicted wounds to hand or foot, the round had to be fired through a loaf of black bread. Feigned illness became prevalent before major offensives, under battle stress of long duration or where general environmental conditions were bad. 
Even officers and NCOs could succumb in this way, and occasionally segments of the front were left unattended after more senior ranks abandoned their charge, leaving subordinates in the lurch. Surprised by the degree of bitter resistance they encountered, the Russians finally gave it up as a bad job and transferred the bulk of their force to the northeast, reinforcing an offensive that held out more promise. German reconnaissance had been on the alert for such indications, and the change in objective was quickly spotted. At last, the survivors of 144 could be withdrawn to the rearward assembly area, acknowledging with satisfaction that Herr Hauptmann had stated the truth when he forecast that a new defensive line had been set up. In temporary safety, we lay strewn on the floor of the earth bunker in utter exhaustion when a medic sergeant aroused us from our stupor. Men, here's ink for your fountain pens, he proclaimed as he passed from one man to another, distributing small glass files of tablets under the label Pervitin. These were methamphetamines, which suppressed hunger and the desire to sleep, increased psychic resistance, and induced a slight euphoria. Just what the doctor ordered. When you feel run down, he explained, as though he was addressing a bunch of the over fifties, just pop one of your pills and your inner motor will run a little better. But a word to the wise, don't overdose, or you will flake out quicker than you can say peep, and that's the last thing we want, isn't it? Evidently these pills were the priority, for only after he had finished the distribution and pep talk did he turn his attention to the wounded being brought in. After a few hours comatose sleep, we were shaken awake and ordered to take a pill. Afterwards we were served hot coffee and a couple of slugs of schnapps. This mixture was making itself felt by the time we were on the road for the defensive line, and to burn off the worst of our strange mood, after half an hour we were ordered towards the Russian offensive at the double. The men of an infantry division were in urgent need of support, and 144 was going to provide it. The only thing was, it meant that we had a very long march ahead of us. A thaw had set in, and we were obliged to force a way through an often knee-high quagmire. Boots and socks were saturated and then weighted down by thick mud. In total exhaustion, our progress forward was mechanical. It was not uncommon to come across a man who had fallen asleep upright in the place where he had come to a standstill. A comrade would take his hand and drag him onwards. Minutes later he would come fully awake and, in shock, remember nothing. The effort required on this march was so enormous that it virtually defeated the pervitin tablets. I carried my sniper's rifle slung across my back, the weapon wrapped around by a thick strip of tent cloth to protect it against the mud. My MP40 dangled across my chest. I had developed the habit of chewing dry biscuits to stave off lethargy. I had a store of them for which I traded my cigarette ration. More lay behind the Russian manoeuvres than a mere transfer of the weight of their attack strongpoint. Their operation developed into a major offensive which on 30 January 1944 drove a great wedge through the German lines, threatening to double round two German armies at the Basavluk estuary on the Great Bend in the Dnieper. As was so often the case, the OKH dallied until it was almost too late before ordering an urgent shortening of the front. Our forces were saved only by the incompetence of the Russian commanders who, at the decisive moment, elected to rest and reorganize away from the critical area rather than mass for the crucial thrust to the Dnieper bend. More by luck than judgment, therefore, the OKH succeeded in arranging their forces in such a manner that the Russian operation, when it came, ran up against enough resistance to stifle it, and it was to support these positions that we ploughed our way through the mire. Wearing soaking winter battle gear, hunger and exhaustion etched in our faces, we fought mechanically, ghosts driven only by the personal desire to survive. There were no pauses in the battle any longer. I fell ill. Constant hypothermia combined with drinking the water found in bomb craters resulted in severe gastroenteritis. During one of his rounds, the battalion commander found me curled up like a wounded animal, trembling in the corner of a shelter. Hauptmann Max Kloss was a dark-haired young officer of slight build, who had taken command of the battalion at the Nikopol bridgehead. He had volunteered to transfer to the Russian front from Lapland in the belief that he would be of greater service to the Reich, where soldiers were needed most urgently. He was impregnated with National Socialist values, 
which stated that a thing worth doing was worth doing well, and as an outward expression of his belief, he wore the red and white diamond-shaped badge of the Hitler Youth beside the Iron Cross, first class on the left breast pocket of his uniform tunic. On the other pocket he wore the German cross in gold. Yet he was no blindly faithful party follower, but rather a committed and brave soldier. Seeing my pitiful condition, he requested an explanation from my company commander, who was accompanying him. The latter replied that I was a sniper who knew his business. We need every specialist, we've got to get this man on his feet, Kloss stated firmly. He is the last sniper we have left. I cannot afford to lose him. So saying, he ordered me to report to the battalion command post and associate with the dispatch runners. Tell them to look after you, he said, adding as he turned to the other officer, I hope you have no objection, Herr Oberleutnant. The latter shrugged his shoulders. Trembling, I rose and dragged myself off. It was a kilometre, and after a series of toilet stops on the way, I arrived at the runner's lodge, a hole excavated into the ground with a roof of logs, threw myself into the sleeping area and groaned. The commander says you're supposed to look after me. To start off, if you don't mind, I need new trousers. Certainly, Fräulein Allerberger, the professor will be along shortly to powder your tender little arse, one confirmed. But all the same, they really did look after me, supplying me with tea without milk and an extremely effective diarrhoea preventive called Dolentin. This was an antispasmodic analgesic developed by Hoechst in 1939 and used to suppress the pain from wounds. In the early 1940s, Hoechst chemists succeeded in increasing its effectiveness twentyfold, the new drug having the name Polamidon. In 1944, Germany produced around 650 tonnes of analgesics. Dolentin, bedrest and proper nutrition restored me to health within a few days. The nursing care lavished on me by the dispatch runners was a tremendous help. The battalion commander visited me occasionally to inquire after my progress, and during our talks it emerged that we saw eye to eye on many things. On the day I regained mobility, albeit still shaky around the knees, Kloss told me, It's high time we got you back to work. There are four new NCOs coming. I have put them with your company. I was thinking you might show them what you know. My driver will take you. Fifteen minutes later, I was in a Kubelwagen spluttering down a dirt track to company. We were less than three minutes out when the left side front wheel hit a landmine. The steering wheel was knocked from the driver's grasp and the vehicle sheared to the left. I heard a cry of shit and found myself hurtling through the air alongside the driver, the pair of us making a soft landing in the quagmire skirting the track. The Kubelwagen tipped over and came to rest on its side minus a wheel. Neither of us dared move, and we remained pressed to the ground. That shit thing must have been one of ours, the driver said. Yesterday it was mine-free here, and Ivan hasn't been near the place for days. Are you hurt? Apart from a few bruises, I had escaped scot-free again. On all fours, feeling our way gingerly forward with our fingertips, we made our way back to the car. While discussing our next move, we saw a column of engineers, pioneer approaching. What are you people doing here? the corporal cried, and who gave you permission to set off our carefully laid mines? Their gentle cynicism failed to mollify us. You assholes are supposed to tell people where you are putting your mines, the driver retorted. Well, now you know, came the response, and if you're rude, we'll just leave you here. I suggest that you two gentlemen tag along behind us, the platoon corporal said, leading off smartly. That Kubelwagen's not going anywhere, so we might as well follow, my driver muttered. The road to company was barriered off, and we were soon back at battalion headquarter to deliver our report. The outcome was that Kloss placed me under his direct command and lodged me with the dispatch runners. The latter shaved every morning, a ritual I had attempted to observe for some time, lived beyond the direct line of fire, wore clean uniforms and ate regularly and I considered this a great improvement to living in a trench at company. The Russians threw everything at us in the attempt to achieve their objective. On the battlefield, we wanted to fight by rules, and so avoid all-out mayhem. Our attempts to convince the Soviets met with little success, 
The Soviets set the ground rules from the beginning and repaid our initial success with barbarity. Particularly incomprehensible, however, was their unspeakable bestiality to civilian populations, not only enemy and neutral, but Russian as well. Despite heavy bombardment, we succeeded in transporting two desperately needed batteries from GR-112, artillery regiment, into the Nikopol bridgehead by rail. There was an immediate threat of encirclement, and it had been decided to evacuate the seriously wounded. Only one locomotive had survived the incoming endeavour undamaged, and it was to return to the west pulling an ambulance train composed of cattle trucks painted with the Red Cross on a white background on the side panelling. That morning, when in a platoon marching to our new positions, our route took us past the loading bay. Hundreds of wounded, many wearing only the scantiest field dressings to cover terrible injuries, lay around the wagons. We were appalled at the numbers of dead and horribly mutilated. Upon seeing us, hope revived in the eyes of the moribund. Many made the same plea. Hold off, Ivan, until the train has got clear. The words struck a chord in the hearts of one or two riflemen and ignited in them a spark of motivation to do the best they could to comply. In reality, the situation was desperate, for the Soviets had come to within 1,500 metres of the loading bay. Upon leaving the area we came under fire. Vastly outnumbered, our resistance amounted to little more than a delaying tactic. Meanwhile, the ambulance train had managed to pull away, but the Soviets switched their priority to destroying it by artillery bombardment, and a few minutes later it was strafed and bombed from the air by fighters. The truck carrying the medical personnel received the first direct hit, killing all but two of the surgeons. An explosion derailed the train, the trucks piling into each other at crazy angles, spewing out the wounded in all directions. The magnitude of the disaster was such that the few surviving surgeons and medics were utterly overwhelmed. 